My name's Todd Ronstead. I'm a documentary filmmaker and not an expert in prehistory or copper country, but I've been lucky enough to uh, get involved with a project for the last five years um, called Sacred Ground. And I was approached by some people in the Ho-Chunk tribe and some other folks, like people in the Ancient Earthworks Society down in Madison, who are involved with effigy, Indian effigy mounds in Wisconsin. And we started doing something which I think is new. And, and, and that is to try to bring people together in a different way. We have, we have oral tradition from the Ho-Chunk tribe um, that connects to particular places in the region. Um, we have people like yourselves who have an interest in prehistory and expertise in particular areas. And we're all interested in this past. And we're interested in the culture. And we're interested in the artifacts. And the idea of sacred ground was to try and bring all of those folks together and to try to help popularize an understanding of this tremendously rich past that we have here in the upper Midwest. Um, that the Native American history has been um, quite often not visible to the general population. And so we have this whole process of people like yourselves um, sharing ideas, sharing our knowledge. Um, and we have the Ho-Chunk tribe starting to open up about more of this history and all of us kind of realizing that we're all in this together. You know, I think a lot of this history, a lot of the archeological work, there's been a, a schism between the Native Americans and the scientists and the academics, and much of that still remains. Um, but one of the ideas of sacred ground is that, you know, we're starting to recognize each other as brothers, and we're starting to see that we are together, not separate. And, and you know, it's people like the Ancient Earthwork Society um, have sort of been at a distance from the Native Americans in the past, but everybody's been trying to get along and get together. And, and this has been part of that process of rather than just outsiders trying to understand a culture, that let's come together and let's start to compare notes and let's start to learn from each other. So uh, there, is a, there is a page on YouTube called the Sacred Ground Documentary Series. Uh, and we already have 99 videos up. One of the things that I've brought to the picture is a belief that I have, which is that it's, it's, it's particularly powerful to bring the experts together with the locations, to, to find ourselves on that ground. And with video technology, you know, we can make movies. We can make a series of videos and documentaries about particular places and sacred sites. And our landscape is dotted with them. And so I just picked out four examples today uh, that I wanted to show you, and I hope our, our technology here is good enough for you to hear some of these videos. Um, but I'm going to start with one of the first things we did five years ago. And, and let me know if the audio is wrong because we'll stop and try to figure out a way to make sure that you can hear it. Um, but one of the people who spoke last year was a, a Ho-Chunk gentleman named Richie Brown. I was hoping he could be here this year, uh, but he wasn't able to make it. And he's sort of the, the main character in, in this first video where he is talking about bringing together oral tradition stories from the Ho-Chunk 
with the sites that still remain on the landscape in Wisconsin and the upper Midwest. And it's, I think it's kind of a good intro to the idea of what we end up doing with the rest of many of our videos. There's uh, a lot of stories that see, the people who live there now are original. And they'll tell you, you know, right when come right out, they'll tell you we've only been here 200 years in the West. And these moms were here before us. We're the caretakers now, but they're not ours. And, and that's, uh, no. That's Barriga. Anything that, when you're, they're battling with any, anybody up there, that they, they can't claim the, the legacy there. Because, you know, they'll admit that what, what you're finding there doesn't belong to them. So that's the problem they got. There's a whole chunk, you know, and we were up there a couple years ago with uh, some members of our traditional court, and they looked at them and they said, oh, yeah, those are a whole chunk. What happens is all these things tie together. There's a site up there that, that ties right in with Frank's Hill down here. It's the same, you know, when they start telling these stories, it, it, it's like a thread, a fabric, it just weaves right into another. So the Frank's Hill, the hill we'll go visit a little bit, is just as important. It's actually an integral part of our whole history. And it's not only the Ho-Chunk, but the, the Northern Cheyenne have a story that goes with Frank's Hill. And they can, they can tell it to you. And there was a time, we were talking back in the last ice age, where now everybody was a lot closely related then. And there's a story that, that happened up in the, the UP where the tribe got too big for the resources. So they, they basically sent uh, different bands in seven different directions. And that's where a lot of the tribes in the uh, West come from, was from Wichita. Like just, they sent them because there wasn't any place for them or any food left to eat. So they, they went east, they went west, they, they went all over the country. This is all of the Driftless area, and this is the refuge for the, the tribes when they were forced out of Canada and places. It was, it was, it was encircled by ice for I don't know how many years. So they had to make their living in here, and they formed many of their customs. And uh, the story on the, the hill I'm showing you, they explain the creator brought the corn seed to them here. Now, it could have been the creator, it could have been the Maya and Indians who came up and gave the sea. They also were introduced to the buffalo in this area. They, they lived in the Kekapu, but then some of our stories talk about living on the ice. See, right, right at the edge of the ice, that's where all the flora and fauna was. That's where all the, the animals were, the big animals. And if you go over to Lansing, Iowa, there's actually a couple mounds right there in town that are. Uh, they won't call them, or they try to say they're elephant mounds, but why is there a mammoth? Then, of course, they say, well, uh, you know, the archaeologists say, well, there wasn't any mammoths when the mound builders were here. But it, that isn't the, the, what you're seeing. What you're seeing is at the time that the mound, mound building started, that was one of the stories, and that's how they marked the spot. Is that's where they see them. And there's also, there's supposed to be one that's just up over the hill here, that was an uh, 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 elephant mound too. So, you know, it, this is where they come, they, they come off the glacier here and they put around here. So, so the uh, stories go way back and it's, it's hard, hard to fathom some of this when you, you sit down and they start talking about it. The other thing is to get them to talk about it. Because a lot of these stories will tell them the lodge and they can't talk about all the size of the lodge. But here, what you work with is bits and pieces. But when you're standing on an elephant mound, you can't deny it, and the story kind of trickles off. That's Frank's Hill down, at, down near Muscaday. It's a, it's a calendar mound. Jim Schurz has done a lot of work there. Uh, it's really an amazing place if you haven't seen it. Uh, there was a whole um, series of eagle, eagle mounds, just a huge um, section of mounds. It's, probably 30% of which remain along the Wisconsin River there, which is obviously a very important location. Uh, we've also you know, gotten involved with the archeological community 
And um, this is uh, Kurt Sampson from the Wisconsin Archaeological Society. We've, we've gone out and he's kind of an expert on effigy mounds. And um, this is one of the videos we did with him at Lizard Mound State Park. Okay, so coming here uh, as a young boy and, and seeing this mound uh, and this entire mound site in the mid-1970s uh, was really inspirational for me from a personal standpoint and was really the, uh, uh, the main reason why I decided to become an archaeologist later in life. Um, after I saw this mound site and uh, got really interested in, in, in Wisconsin prehistory in general, it inspired me even as a young boy to travel all over the state and the adjacent region. And uh, ever since middle school, uh, or grade school, I was coming uh, to sites like this with, uh, with my older brother and directly led you know, to me later on you know, becoming an archaeologist and studying archaeology. It kind of just lit a fire in me to uh, not only uh, learn about these things for myself, but to also share that information with other people. I mean, it, it really is my passion. and. Uh, and I think that uh, part of the problem with preservation issues is obviously just a lack of uh, uh, education as far as people not knowing what these sites are and how they fit into the context of Wisconsin prehistory and, uh, and our collective history as a whole. So coming out here uh, and, and seeing these mound sites, I mean, they're, they're absolutely spectacular. There is nowhere else in the world where you see uh, a concentration of mounds like this anywhere. That, uh, that people were uh, building for, you know, over a, a, a five to six hundred year period with the effigies and nearly a three thousand year period of uh, conical and linear mound construction with the effigies in this area. And, uh, you know, Bob Birmingham often says that, uh, you know, these monuments to the ancient people and, and to their ancestors that are on this landscape all around us they, they're just as spectacular as anything that you would see anywhere around the world, whether it's Stonehenge or the, the pyramids or whatever it would be. Uh, the sheer number of mounds, we'll never know the exact number of mounds, how many there, there were. Unfortunately, they were starting to be destroyed, you know, in the, as early as the 1820s in some cases. But, uh, I mean, you know, today there are over a thousand individual effigy mound sites that still remain in Wisconsin alone with over uh, 3,500 effigy forms that are still there, where there might have been anywhere from 25 to 30,000 mounds on this landscape at one time before uh, uh, European contact and, and eventual destruction through development and farming and things like that. So even though there were a ton of mounds that were here, and there still are quite a few of them that remain, that we have an obligation as a, uh, as a, as a people as a collective community and as uh, the most current people on this landscape to care for and protect these mounds and, and make sure that they're being cared for in the proper manner. One of the reasons this has kind of become even more important since we started the project, um, I don't know if any of you have heard about this, but in Wisconsin, in the legislature, um, there was a, there was a, 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 a quarry um, that, that had effigy mounds on it, and they'd not been allowed to um, destroy it because of Wisconsin's Burial Mounds Protection Act. So Wisconsin law is that if there is, you know, a, a burial mound, well, you know, any sort of burial, then it, it can't be destroyed. And unfortunately, um, the, the company has been arguing, well, th there's no body in there. And the truth is that these monuments are so significant and so important of cultural you know, cultural significance and meaning um, that it really shouldn't matter whether you can still determine whether a, there was ever a body in there. Usually there was, it, it, it seems, but, you know, this is over a thousand years ago and, and you know, quite often you, you can't really tell. So industry 
uh, introduced a piece of legislation to say if you can't if you can't positively prove that there is a body in there, uh, then they can destroy it. Oh, no. And so um, the, you know the Ho Chunk tribe was in an uproar, and but but the shocking thing is that the general public and legislators have no idea about these these mounds and this prehistory. They're they're completely ignorant. They don't know that they're there, and. Um, W without having any of that understanding, how, you know, how can we expect them to care? You know, so part of, part of what we've been doing with this project is to, to try and spread this knowledge a bit. And I, and I think this process of, of going to these locations and, and, and talking about them and, you know, trying to help people get a, a better understanding of our prehistory and uh, the culture and the, and the richness of the sites that we have in this region, um, it, it's really important for some very practical reasons as well as the fact that we're very interested in it. Um, please feel free to interrupt me with questions at any time if you have any, um, uh, or we can do that at the end too. An, a, another one I wanted to show you was that in meeting people from Ancient Earthworks and you know, it's, it's just been kind of a spirit guided process uh, to get hooked up with the right people, but some of you may know Dr. Jack Steinbring, um, who is a, a petroglyph rock art expert at Ripon College. And there's a site called the Hensler site in central Wisconsin, where um, there, it's, a, it's a very significant site for a lot of different reasons. So it's, I went there to talk to Dr. Jack, and we made a series of uh, probably eight, eight or nine videos about this particular site. And um, it, it's a good example of um, being on location and how you can picture something in a way uh, using this medium that you can't really with an academic paper, I think. <laughs> um, so he and Richie Brown are at the Hensler site here. <laughs> People came here periodically, and somehow one generation told another generation that this was here and this was important, but uh, they're discontinuous. It's continuous like every month or every year. There's a big gap of time, like 300, 500 years. Some cases, thousands of years between the uh, imagery making, which is amazing because there's continuity in the knowledge of where the site is and what it means. It was powerful. It was a, a place of uh, distinction, sacred site. And they, came here from many different directions and they learned about it from their immediate ancestors who learned it from their immediate ancestors. So you've got, uh, while discontinuity, you still have a form of continuity because the memory of this place and its power and its character is transmitted from generation to generation, even if they don't come back here all the time. Uh, you see that with the Ho because they, they carry all the stories, but they've lost the location of some of these places. Mm -hmm. Back when I was younger, that was my job was to actually find the sites and match the stories. As soon as you did that, they'd get there and then they knew exactly where they were. Yeah. And the story just floods right back to them. was there, one of the different videos we have that I won't show you today, but I'd encourage you to check out is um, I was um, 
shooting Jack while he was explaining something to me and he was looking down at that little corridor where there's just a lot of um, pecked um, petroglyphs. And while I had the camera on him, he said, no, it couldn't be. And he, he, he discovered an, a, it was a, a stone tool shaped um, petroglyph that they had not that they had they had not identified in the seven years they've been working there and he he did that on camera it was it was an amazing experience and you know they you know they've they've since since dated that and and I, you know I believe he said eight or nine thousand years of BP and and so um, you could also see that that place was in the middle of a stone quarry and the people that own that quarry they think they've been great by just piling these berms around this sacred site. Um, and, of course, the site has been changed by the fact that this mining has gone on around it and, and you don't get the same sight lines and there's all sorts of things that, that they're missing. Um, the excavations are still going on. They're finding more and more things. Um, but this, is, this place it is you know, potentially the oldest rock art site in North America. And it doesn't matter to anybody other than the specialists because they don't know anything about it. The legislators don't know anything. Um, the people in the town near there, Watertown, don't know anything about it. Somehow the dynamic needs to change where we honor and preserve these places. That, we're, that it's not just um, enthusiasts and academics and some Native Americans that, that know and honor and preserve th these places. And, and so a big part of this project so far, and hopefully as, it, as it's ongoing, is to um, do more to connect the culture, do more to try to understand um, that prehistoric culture and, and, and connect it to uh, our modern world um, so it can surface the way, the way we put it in um, our grant applications are that the Sacred Ground documentary series is dedicated to restoring native memory landscape to its rightful place in our collective memory. Um, because it needs to be there or everything is going to be destroyed. And um, telling these stories is, a, is a, part of, a part of changing that dynamic, I think. Uh, you know, although this doesn't I guess directly relate to, to copper culture. When I was here last year, I mean, it was so clear to me all these powerful stories uh, that all of you know about the copper culture up here and the finds and the tools and the locations. I mean, these are stories. I mean, th these are powerful stories of our common humanity. And, you know, I think we should tell them. And, and the more experts that, that get old and pass away, the more of those stories we, we lose. Part of the reason I came into this project with the Ho-Chunk, I believe, is they had all sorts of elders with their oral tradition stories that were starting to, to be gone. And, and they're, they're fearful of, of, of losing um, so much of that oral tradition. So um, that's also part of why there's an opening up and a coming together, I believe, uh, on this. And, and I just want to show you one last uh, video which you know, is part of the privilege of, of getting to know Preston Thompson, who um, has, has since passed away, but was, was an elder on the, on the Ho-Chunk tribal court. And uh, he showed me a lot of things and, and, and took me out um, as he taught other people to, how to build lodges. And you know, it all comes from oral tradition. There, there is you know, these stories that were in their heads are, are also connected to these tools, <laughs> you know. All of, all of this culture is, you know, there, there is still oral tradition that echoes uh, so, you know, so much of this past. And, and, and the more we can start to put all of that together and, um, you know, not to segment ourselves, I think um, the, the richer we'll, we'll all be. Um, and this is Preston. Once this language is lost, the world will walk into the 
hired fun. And I think I understand that the world would go into to this apoc apocalyptic thing. But rather than those those wars and those teachings that were given to us would disappear. You have to build their own support. Well, I was flying back to England one time and I found myself thinking in English. And I cried. And it took me a long time to get back, back into thinking in Ho Chunk. And when someone talks to me, I translate what's being said in Ho Chunk and translate back home. I'm not going to say. Trying to add an angle like this. You've never seen the snake's ribs stick off straight up on top of it. That's good. So, so, so that's what you're building. You know, it's, it, it varies and it's no, no set uh, uh, rituals that you okay, we're going to bring in one person to right. do something like this. One of the um, choosing someone is to replace someone that had passed away. And when, when the uh, uh, Creator was teaching us his uh, way of life, uh, he knew we had to have a building. So he asked our grandmother to, to help. And so she provided us with, 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 with these uh, ribs. This side is the black snake, or cassette. And so it, it, it continues on to the next generation, and, it, and there's no really specific age that you need to be. Uh, earlier this year, we had two boys that were like, uh, what, 12 years old, 13 years old? No, they're about 14. 14, 15. And I think I was 32 when I went in, you know, so that was 37 years ago, really. She got all of them together and told them what needed to be done. And so they built this house for us. And we're just replicating that house, which is why they're having an angle of this talk about that. I know that I lived in uh, uh, Houston, Texas, and they have like, like a short ceremony. And I would come up for that and fly up and then fly back the next day. It was about a thousand dollars a trip by the time you would figure out uh, airline transportation bills. Staying up all night and then flying back the next day. And I remember I did that six times in one month, you know, so I had a little dedication and everything. This one is the black snake, that side is the beast. And so I'm having my, my nephew for tobacco. And so the, the, the standards that, that were used in the old days was that uh, they looked at, at, at your moral values. Uh, they looked to see if you were, if, if you understood a whole chunk. And uh, had respect for, for elders. Um, understood what, what was being said. And of course that has changed you now, but, but most of the young members hold those values except for a chunk. But now, the ones that uh, we've been putting in are really understanding and, and dedicated to learning culture. Like, uh, like they can sing, really fantastic, and is beginning to take lessons from me in, in Ocean. And so it becomes like setting up um, units of study based on what they want to learn rather than, which is this, um, this is called uh, andreogogy, you know, t teaching adults, which is different from pedagogy, t teaching uh, young children. Pedagogy is what we're going to teach you, and andreogogy is what do you want to learn that we'll teach you. And that is really awesome with uh, lightning. You know, because they can sing the songs without understanding the words, but then uh, to, to develop or to Bring them to a point to where they, they understand what they're saying when they're singing is really a big, big process. And it's awesome because that's what the society is based on is our language. And that hasn't changed. The, the, the words have changed. 
but the concept hasn't changed in thousands of years. So this is down in southern Iowa by Nebraska. The Winnebago tribe down there that had been forcibly re relocated is still down there. I mean, that's another name for the Ho-Chunk. And they had asked Preston to come down and help. They'd, they'd lost their knowledge about how to build these lodges and he came down and, and taught them um, the traditions that they'd forgotten. So um, just to conclude, I, I, you know, I appreciate um, your interest in this, and, and I think it relates to everything that, that, we're, that we're talking about here. Um, I certainly hope that, that, that we continue to, to grow this project. And you know, I'd also en encourage um, you know, those of you with an expertise in, in, our, in our area here to, to think about things that, that maybe should be videotaped, um, to think about important locations and um, people with particular wisdom. And maybe, you know, maybe, maybe we should do some things, uh, do some more things um, like we did with Preston before he died um, to, to help preserve uh, that knowledge and to, um, you know, make some big changes in about how we understand these things and, and how we come, come together to protect the sacred ground and to, to honor uh, our rich prehistory here. Yeah, thank you, Todd. <laughs> got a great message and yes, you got to keep that up not thank you well speaking here but also through the film thank you um,